Okay, we're going to give this a try. Um, I'm not going to have handouts for this. You can just uh, follow along and listen. I find that is the best way uh, to learn these apologetics topics. In fact, when I was really hardcore getting started in this, I basically just downloaded some podcasts from some apologists that I liked and burned them on a CD and listened to them in my car uh, over and over. It was actually a couple of years before I even started reading uh, their books. I just listened to them uh, say these things over and over, and that's one of the best ways to learn it, I've found. Your mileage may vary. Uh, I'll make these handouts available to you once we're back in person. I will give you the printouts. But for the most part, to keep it simple right now, let us just uh, listen to it for now. And the first thing you're going to want to do uh, before you even listen to the first video is I would like you to uh, go ahead and find the accounts of the crucifixion and the resurrection in all four Gospels. Pick two, at least, for right now. I'm going to recommend Luke and John, uh, but you can read Mark, you can read Matthew, it doesn't matter. Uh, and they're all four going to have a few different facts in them. That is one of the points. Uh, and I will also have a handout for you guys once we're back in person. That's from a book called The Synopsis of the Gospels. It will actually put right next to each other, verse by verse, uh, the stories actually does the whole uh, New Testament this way, or the whole uh, Gospels this way. Uh, it'll go through all the crucifixion and resurrection accounts uh, verse by verse and kind of put them chronologically as they happen uh, so that you can see side by side all of the differences. I don't know that that at this point in your study of the Bible is uh, really necessary for you to dig into that deeply, uh, but I would like you to read at least two accounts of the resurrection, two accounts of the crucifixion. Uh, so if you do that and then come back to the video and then we'll start here. Uh, so one of your jobs is to find them in your Bibles, uh, find them and read them. And we'll go ahead and begin what we're going to do here uh, in this unit, and it may go into a couple of videos because this can get kind of long, uh, is the evidence for the resurrection of Christ and how to refute uh, the big theories that the so-called skeptics and atheists have, the problems they have with the biblical accounts, and the theories that they have for what actually happened uh, on Easter morning between uh, Jesus' death on Good Friday and his supposed resurrection on Easter morning. And we will dismantle all of these arguments. They're uh, logically unsound, and you'll see as we go through it that uh, even even as kids, uh, you guys can handle this stuff. Uh, this is not rocket science. This is a lot of common sense uh, once you have been exposed to it. And these topics will come up even uh, as young people going into high school again and in college. Uh, your friends, friends that you have that aren't Christians, are going to know these arguments uh, if they get into a discussion with you about them, and it is good to be able to refute them. But remember, the point of this is not to take their arguments apart and crush them into the dust, as fun as that can be, uh, depending on how close of friends you are with them. It could be a lot of fun, uh, and there won't be any hard feelings. But some people will think, oh, you're just out to crush them. No, you want to do this with love to show them that, no, uh, what you have heard someone else say uh, has been refuted for hundreds, and in, in this case, a couple of thousand years. Uh, so let's, let's dig right into it. There are um, five main theories about what happened between Good Friday and Easter morning. Uh, when all of these other four fall off the map, you're going to be left with one, the one at the top there. Jesus actually died, and he actually rose from the dead, exactly what we believe in Christianity. But there are these other four theories that after, again, after almost 2,000 years, uh, these stick around and people will parrot them out as if uh, this is scientific fact, and, and it's not. And we're going to learn how to uh, dismantle these arguments. Okay, the first one, Jesus didn't die on the cross. He passed out from his injuries. They thought he was dead. They put him in the tomb, which is cut out of solid rock, and it's nice and cool in there. And in the coolness of the tomb, he revived, and then he uh, walked out. 
and we will go through all the reasons why uh, that is not right and that is actually the easiest one to take apart and is also one of the most popular ones uh, that you will encounter. The next one is that the apostles were deceivers, they were liars, and the whole thing was a conspiracy, uh, and a conspiracy that has somehow uh, kept going for 2,000 years. The next one is that the apostles themselves were deceived, and everything was just a big mass hallucination. Uh, a lot of problems with that one as well. And then there is the last one, and that is the apostles made this whole thing up that Jesus rising from the dead is a myth, and we will take that one apart piece by piece as well. So let's begin with the first one, and these notes are for me to talk, so just listen, uh, read along if you want. Again, you will have all of this available, uh, but it is not necessary for you to be taking notes and so forth. Listen to it and let these arguments against these theories uh, just become a part of your knowledge, your knowledge of what you know about uh, Jesus Christ. So, Jesus didn't die, the swoon theory, which claims that he fainted on the cross, he was believed dead, he revived in the coolness of the tomb. There are incredible numbers of problems with this. The first and most important one is Jesus could not have survived crucifixion. We have a word in English that you know called excruciating. Uh, when you are in a lot, a lot of pain, you'll say, oh, I have an excruciating headache. The word excruciating comes from Latin, which is the language that our friends, the Romans, who are the people who actually executed Jesus on the cross, spoke. And the Latin words excrucis, from which our word excruciating comes from, means from the cross. So a word which means unimaginable pain comes from this method of execution. Uh, so that gives you an idea how br brutal, absolutely brutal, this method of execution is. The Romans did not invent it. Uh, there were other older civilizations that invented crucifixion, but the one thing the Romans did do is they perfected it. Uh, the Roman execution squads were legendary. And they were very, very, very good at their jobs. Uh, one reason for this is that if they did not do their jobs and someone somehow survived or escaped when they were uh, supposed to be being watched and detained by these people or executed by these people, they themselves would lose their lives. Uh, rather, a lot of incentive to do their job and do it well. The Roman procedures for crucifixion were very, very carefully followed, which eliminated any possibility that a criminal executed in this way uh, would survive. And another thing to point out here, too, is that this, this method of crucifixion, this is not something the Romans just did whenever uh, there was a bad person and they uh, needed to be put to death. Uh, as a means of capital punishment, this was reserved for the worst people. The word we have translated in English in our Bibles as criminal, uh, in today's uh, words, today's language would be a terrorist, seditionist. Uh, this is crimes against the state, uh, treason, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you were a terrorist, this is how you would die. It was very public, and again, it was very brutal. Uh, as an example to other people to not do what these people did, uh, which landed them in this position. That is how they chose to execute uh, Jesus. Now, there is one account of, in, that we have in the historical record of someone surviving crucifixion. And as many exceptions to rules uh, go, the exception to the rule proves the rule. Uh, four men in this account were crucified, and a reprieve, kind of a last minute, governor calls, no, 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 uh, take them down. And they, they took these four people down, and three of the four died anyway from their wounds, which tells you just how brutal uh, this was, uh, was as a means of execution. And that was after they were given the very best medical care uh, that they could be given at the time. So three out of those four uh, people died anyway 
even though they were taken down from the cross. And again, any Roman soldier who allowed a prisoner to escape in any way, including a bungled execution, would be executed himself, and he would be executed in the same way. He would have found himself uh, crucified himself. Uh, allowing escape never happened. Uh, furthermore, Jesus had been scourged uh, prior to his crucifixion. We know from the Gospel accounts that uh, Pilate had Jesus scourged before he was crucified. He was scourged to show this beaten, uh, brutally beaten man to the crowd, hoping they would say, okay, let him go, uh, which, of course, they did not. They just shouted all the more, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, the historical accounts of the tools used, the methods used for this scourging, uh, is extremely graphic. I am not going to get into it. Uh, when I have done my Bible study on the Gospel of John, this is the part people cringed uh, because we went into the detail of exactly what happens when you are scourged by the Romans. And it is not a polite uh, whipping uh, with a whip like you see in movies. Uh, the closest thing you'll ever see probably in a movie is The Passion of the Christ, which everyone will tell you the scourging scene is very hard to watch. And that isn't even close to how brutal this beating actually was. Not to go into too much of the detail, but when you were whipped by one of these uh, Roman flagellums, which had uh, lead weights at the end, it tore the flesh from your body. It laid your back open to your spine. Bones were exposed. Uh, you were tied to a post. And as you twisted in your pain, this whip would whip around your body and would tear the soft flesh of your um, abdomen, and often your internal organs were even exposed. Many people died as a result of the scourging and never even made it uh, to the crucifixion. That is how brutal this was. And we know that Jesus' scourging was this severe uh, because he only lived on the cross for six hours before he died. Um, Again, also, he was carrying the sins of the world, but a crucifixion victim would suffer often for days on end, unless, as we'll see later, their uh, legs are broken so that they cannot breathe. Uh, so that is enough about that, but just to know that this beating is uh, not anything you have ever seen before. It is extremely brutal uh, and extremely hard on the body. Many, many people did not survive it uh, alone before they were even crucified. They never made it to their cross. Okay, Jesus' legs were not broken, so we know that he died on the cross. Uh, Jewish law would not allow the bodies to remain on the cross through the Sabbath. Therefore, uh, these men had to be taken down uh, before sundown. Uh, or in the case of the Gospels, we know that the sun uh, was was uh, obscured, it was dark already, but the day had not ended. Uh, so uh, their legs were broken to make them die faster. Uh, when you are on the cross, and the paintings we have don't really uh, necessarily show it accurately, but when you are suspended on the cross with your arms up like this and your feet uh, nailed uh, to a block, you had to push up with your feet to be able to draw breath and then of course, you cannot hold your weight like that, and you would sag and would push the air out of your lungs. And the only way you could get another breath would be to push up with your legs again. And you would do this over and over and over as you were on the cross. Uh, so uh, if you cannot do that, you were speedily going to die of suffocation. Uh, Jesus' legs were not broken uh, because he was found to be already dead. Now, St. John recorded that he saw blood and water flow from Jesus' side when the centurion pierced him with a spear. Uh, Jesus' side was pierced by the spear as a double check to ensure that he was dead. It wasn't a poke to see if he, oh, he twitched, he's still alive. The spear would have pierced through his lung and then into the pericardial sac around the heart, uh, hence the flow of blood and water. Uh, water collects in the lungs uh, when a victim of crucifixion succumbs to asphyxiation. 
So as you're trying to breathe, your lungs are filling with water. And then the sac around your heart uh, also starts to fill with water as you start to uh, suffocate and you go into what is called hypovolemic shock. Uh, from blood loss, you go into uh, shock, which is the actual cause of, of death. So Jesus drowned in his own fluids as a result of the crucifixion. Uh, so that Roman execution squad, squad will have left absolutely nothing to chance. They saw that he was already dead, and they pierced him with the spear anyway to make sure he was dead. Okay, and then Jesus' body was encased in the traditional linen wrappings in, accord, in accordance with Jewish tradition and burial laws, uh, along with uh, spices, and then the women came Easter morning to put even more spices. Uh, but that wrapping in the linen would have covered his face and his entire body. He would not have been able to move uh, if he were still alive. Uh, he probably would not have been able to free himself from these bindings at all even if he were to have passed out as a result of this brutal means of execution that nobody else has ever survived before. Uh, he would not have been able to uh, unwind himself from his uh, burial shroud. And then Jesus' post-resurrection appearances convinced his disciples that he had risen from the dead, not merely woken up in the cool of the tomb. We know from the Gospel accounts how doubtful and cowardly the apostles were. Uh, they were far too fickle to believe that Jesus had died and risen from the dead if he had merely passed out, awakened in the tomb, and then staggered out half dead and sick, near to death. And wherever the disciples were gathered, uh, presented himself and said, hey, fellas, I, I've risen from the dead. Uh, they would not have believed it. They would have went, oh, Okay, no, they were far too skeptical to have accepted that. Uh, and they certainly would not have worshipped him as their Lord, nor as the one who had conquered death. So that alone uh, would tell you that there is no possible way Jesus could have survived the scourging, the crucifixion, being wrapped up tightly in bandages and put into, uh, put into the tomb. Finally. How could a half-dead Jesus overcome the guards placed at the tomb? Now, you know from reading the account of the crucifixion that the Jews were afraid that they were going to say, oh, Jesus raised from the dead because he said he would. So they asked the Romans to set a guard, and the Romans said, you have a guard, set them, seal the tomb. So there is, even if it were possible for a man scourged by the Romans, crucified by the Romans, to overcome a detachment of Roman soldiers who are the best trained, the best equipped, and the most highly skilled military force in the world for hundreds of years, hundreds of years yet to come and already in history, who were set to guard his tomb. No way. There is no way that one beaten, half-dead person who had been crucified could possibly overcome one of these guys, let alone an entire group of them. On top of that, how could a half-dead Jesus remove the stone which was sealing the tomb? Now, these stones that were used to seal these hewn stone tombs in first century Palestine would have been impossible for a half-dead man uh, to move. In fact, it would have been impossible for one man of any sort to move, especially from the inside. Uh, these stones sealed the tomb almost airtight, and protected the bodies inside from animal scavengers. And the archaeological evidence shows that these stones may have weighed as much as two tons. That's 4,000 pounds. Uh, even square, smaller square stones would have weighed a half a ton or more. Uh, it would be virtually impossible for all but the strongest men in the best prime of their life and their best condition to be able to even budge one of these things from the inside. Uh, yet, somehow, people say, oh, Jesus must have done that. They can't believe that he was the Son of God, but they can believe that he was uh, stronger than anyone you've ever seen on the world's strongest man.
Or they say the disciples could have moved it. Now, if the disciples had done it, they also would have had to overcome the guard detachment, uh, which would make the apostles liars. And then we move into the conspiracy theory, uh, which we will get into next. Meanwhile, neither the Jews nor the Romans would have moved the stone. The Romans would ensure that the tomb remained sealed to stave off a Jewish revolt. They don't want any more trouble with the Jews in Palestine. Uh, they're already far more trouble than they're worth. Uh, they do anything they can just to keep the peace, to keep these people quiet. Uh, so when the Jewish authorities uh, make a stink about something, the Romans will immediately do just about anything they want under the authority of the governor to keep the peace. Uh, the governor, Pilate, was already in trouble with the emperor uh, for a revolt that had began earlier in his, um, in his rule there, uh, where he had put up some shields in an area that was uh, considered holy to the Jews, and they considered those to be false idols, and there was a big stink about it. And you can read about that in some of the Jewish uh, historians' uh, work. A man named Josephus recorded it. So... Pilate's already been in trouble with the emperor. He doesn't want to be in trouble again. He wants peace in his governorship. Uh, he does not want these people riled up. So these Roman soldiers would not of their own accord have let anything happen to open that tomb. Meanwhile, the Jews are the ones that had the stone sealed in the first place. Uh, they wanted no tampering and no evidence of tampering because... Uh, they didn't want anybody to claim that Jesus rose from the dead like he said he would. And then again, the Roman guards would have been executed if they had allowed the body of Jesus to escape. Then there is another theory that the guards fell asleep, uh, that the Jewish authorities, we have it in the Gospels recorded, that the Jewish authorities uh, spread this lie. Uh, but again, for the reasons we've already talked about, that would have never happened. The guards would not have fallen asleep on duty. Uh, they would have been scourged themselves for falling asleep on duty. If they had let someone escape, they would have been executed. Even if they had fallen asleep, the people required, the noise it would have made, and the effort of moving this great stone, the Gospels record it was rolled into place, which means it was one of the large round stones that weighed, up, again, up to 4,000 pounds, all that noise would have woken them up. It didn't matter how tired and how deeply asleep these guards were. It would have woken them up. So again, we would move into the realm of the conspiracy theory. But certainly Jesus did not uh, fall asleep in the tomb, or uh, fall asleep on the cross, pass out, and then awaken later. Even if he had, if he had awoken from a, a swoon in the tomb, where did he go? Uh, you have a live body to hide now rather than a dead one. Why did, that, uh, why did that live body disappear? There's no evidence for this. They're not even false claims. Uh, near the time of the crucifixion nor at any time thereafter has anyone written down any kind of story saying, oh, this is what happened and that no, they got him out and they smuggled him away. And as infamous as Jesus was at the time, he would have left some traces, and if he was alone, surely someone would have seen this half-dead man staggering out of this tomb around these sleeping guards. There's just far too many things uh, that are not possible, are completely implausible. So our conclusion is that the swoon scenario is not plausible based on our knowledge of Roman history, as well as modern medicine and what we know about Roman beatings, and Roman crucifixion, what we know of the operation of Roman soldiers and how good, how thorough a Roman execution squad was. So the swoon theory must logically, if you're gonna keep pursuing it, turn into either the conspiracy theory or the myth theory. Either the disciples covered it all up or they were lied to because they recorded that Jesus really died and really rose again. But, of course, as we know, he actually did die and did rise from the dead. And that is the end of this section.